uh, to Community Plus Values um, Community Talks this morning. My name is Ann Ayers. I'm the Dean of the Colorado Women's College and also, oh, I also don't have my video on. Hi. Okay, that's better. <laughs> I'm the Dean of the Colorado Women's College and have the pleasure of serving as the co-lead for the Community Plus Values Initiative, which has really been a labor of love started um, about a year ago at a luncheon that many of you may remember, um, just around the time of uh, Rebecca Chop's announcement about um, her stepping down. And it was um, something that she sort of uh, developed and that Jeremy has really embraced. And I have appreciated so much um, as a newish um, community member here, just how do we create a sense of belonging for everybody? Um, I remember distinctly when I went through my 67 interviews to get this job, it's uh, um, kind of amazing interviewing on an academic campus. Um, some of those were collective, so it wasn't so bad. But throughout my whole day, I asked people what mattered most on this campus. And time and time again, um, the answer was the people. And why did people stay? Because of the people. And why are you inspired? Because of the people. And so today is an opportunity for us to talk um, about those stories, about you, about the people who are making this all happen in this crazy um, pandemic world, but on this incredible campus that is now sort of more spread out than we ever have been. And I'm, um, I'm just thrilled with the folks that we have here today. So we have um, Dr. Queen Langsfeld, who is the interim provost for the University of Denver. Um, thank you for being here, Corrine. And then um, Dr. Shelley Smith Acuna, who is the um, Dean of the Graduate School for Professional Psychology. Um, Dr. Michael Lafar, who is the Executive Director of the Health and Counseling Center. And so they've all joined us. Um, they've really been involved directly in the, what I would call the front lines from a university perspective, but also with the teams who've been on the front lines. And so they have some stories to share um, with you. And we have had some student interviewers along the way, which has been uh, really fun and obviously in keeping with being a university. Today, we also are bringing in um, Chase McNamee, who's a student, but also a really important staff member who has been um, tremendous, jumped in in the last month. He's been here for about a month. So again, an another welcome, Chase. Um, has been here for about a month and has jumped in leading the Community Plus Values um, from a project management perspective and just really um, been terrific. So the way this will work is that Chase is gonna um, ask our panelists some questions. They're gonna engage in some raucous conversation. Um, Karine, try to, you know, <laughs> she's so excited about everything everybody's doing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> she might jump right through the screen at everybody. Um, and then I, I know, I love that you have notes. Um, you have a lot to pick from, which stories to tell. So uh, please submit your questions. We have a Q&A box. We also have the chat box. Um, submit all of that, and I will come back on at about 11.40 and kind of help facilitate those questions. But with all of that, I'm going to pop off, and um, let's get going. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anne. And welcome again. Thank you so much uh, to Shelly, Corrine, and Michael for, for coming on. We're, we're so excited. And I just want to say, as a, as a new community member, I felt so totally welcomed by every single person that I've come in touch with, even amidst these uh, wild circumstances. So I'm um, so glad to be on here and being the interviewer today. So I just want to jump in and, and first check in to just say, uh, you know, we have witnessed so much in the last two weeks. Um, in our community and across the nation. And I just wanna ask, what are some of the best examples of our people showing up in big ways that you have seen over the past weeks? So I got a long list, I'm gonna start. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And, and, and I know for many people, this only feels like it's been two weeks or four weeks, but I want everybody to know that Michael Lafar and Shelly and I've been in this since we went back to the first record that we talked about COVID and it was the first week of January. And so we've been in this a long time at the point. The things that have really inspired me really is, the first one is, is that in this state, like no other state, non-state actors stood up and began to take control of the spread of the disease in a way that was amazing to watch. Higher ed education got together and talked about what our plans were. And a few days later, all the campuses declared online for at least two to three weeks. Um, K-12 superintendents all got together and they, within a day or two of that discussion, decided that they were going to extend spring breaks and uh, close the schools down for a while. I mean, this is amazing to have that type of investment by so many sectors. Um, the other thing that I really want to talk about is in this, 
in this mode, I think what I have gotten to see as a person maybe at the front wave was the opportunity to really lean in and meet people I didn't know about before, who then became people I think of as the heroes, um, really leading from very unexpected positions. And I'm gonna make Michael blush now, um, because when we first started trying to test for positives, there were no tests, they weren't in the state, but we had people declaring symptoms and Michael and his team figured out ways to do other tests to figure out what we were gonna say internally was a presumptive positive and how we would isolate them and react to them well above, well, be, well before any testing arrived in the state. Um, that, that was amazing, but also to have these moments of people from unexpected positions leading in a calm manner, lowering anxiety and increasing clarity and logical thinking. I think it's what's helped navigate our university at least to do the right things at the right moment. There are so many cool stories. And so I'm just gonna go real quick and then you guys can shut me down. We had students say they had no internet access and they were on a Navajo Nation um, land and they didn't have anything yet they still wanted to enroll in spring quarter. Within two hours, we had figured out a way to connect with alum that was on the same Navajo Nation that then put them in contact with the right cellular service so they could actually attend classes. This wasn't thought about, this wasn't planned for. It was creative um, people uh, who just were inspired to work from positions that didn't normally have visibility on this campus. Um, if you think about the research and scholarship on campus and how it is led, right? We had um, Shelley's group stood up this dance party in the mor morning for young children which is on fire in social media. We've had uh, the Daniel School of Business lead uh, alums um, in within an hour had 40 corporation head CEOs in a conversation around how to lead in times of crisis and not telling them what to do, but creating a, a network in which they shared and supported. We've got faculty on this campus that are uh, looking at how COVID inf infiltrates cells and working with the vaccine developers to figure out what vaccines work, leveraging some of our unique infrastructure on campus. We have uh, faculty who are trying to work completely remote, but doing it by accessing national online data to examine how cognitive control under pandemic stress may inform or better inform how emotions and decision-making go together. But we as a faculty and a staff stood up 2000 classes in less than two weeks. Right? That wasn't one person. That was everybody working together. We have staff that out of, out of the goodness of the heart are serving as like TAs in classrooms to make them work better on top of their normal job. We have faculty who've taken on being the second instructor in hundreds of classes, right? This is what inspires me in this. This is our community coming together and demonstrating the spirit that I think CMB has so long wanted to instill. It's here, it's now, it's happening. It's so cool. Okay, you Thank guys. Thank you so much, Corrine. No, it's <laughs> phenomenal. And that's what uh, Anne and I were just talking and brainstorming out C plus V and we were talking about this situation has really just shown where people show up so big for each other in the community. And uh, that's such a cool example of people coming together just to support students and alumni and faculty and staff and hear that one voice. Shelly and Michael, what about you? Are there ways you've seen people showing up in big ways in our community? Yeah, Shelly, do you wanna start or you would like me to jump in? Right, go ahead, please. You know, I, I this has been such a journey as Kareen um, alluded to, we have, um, DU is about champions, about people who are so passionate about their, their work. We throw ourselves into this with our hearts, minds, bodies, and souls. And, and sometimes that means that we can get so caught up in our particular area of expertise. And what this, this pandemic and this crisis has done is it's brought us together. I have developed some beautiful relationships with folks that I might not have had contact with. And one thing I'll say that's really been beautiful as we've gone through this process, as we are 
taking care of the health and the welfare and the safety of our faculty, staff, and students has been on everybody's forefront. That's for, that's been the most important thing. But I will say the words that keep coming up as we're looking at policy, how can we safeguard our community? People talk about DU is not just a place of employment. We are a compassionate community. How might this impact those, those folks on the front line? How can we safeguard the policies and practices that we're putting in place? And that's something that's coming out of everyone's mouth. And I just think what a special place that DU is to think of itself as a uh, compassionate com uh, community that is looking after one another in this way. I don't know that that's happening in other places. And that's because of Kareem's leadership, Jeremy's leadership. That's the expectation that they're setting out for us. And I'm inspired every day with each twist. No, we don't know what's happening. The things that we thought were true, six weeks ago, a month ago, heck, even two weeks ago, are not true today. But we have met each of those challenges with compassion. And that is really, that's what kind of launches me out of bed every day, is that we are taking care of this community and take care of one another, like I don't know that anybody else is. Yeah, I can, I can jump in from there because um, you know, before all this happened, we could say all of these buzzwords, you know, this is about caring for yourself, but also caring for each other. We want to be a resilient community. We want to really um, identify that we're being of service. Uh, but when you live it, when you see these actual examples, it has been really powerful. And I, my, my head's kind of in the way. I decided to sit in front of my lighthouse uh, picture today because I think that quality of of being able to turn to each other kind of as a beacon, you know, that with the Community Plus Values Project saying we, we really value community and we have these core values for service to the community, care for each other, really um, high standards for being that compassionate community. That's our beacon. That's our lighthouse. And it's been interesting. I could even think even before the examples that I had, and I'll give a few, I was thinking about calling Corrine and Michael when we had a presumptive case over a weekend a few weeks ago and feeling like I, they were smart and reasonable and helpful, but also very kind and really wanting to say, how are these people being taken care of? Not just are we complying with what we're supposed to do as administrators, but back to that community piece, how are people being taken care of? And that was so reassuring at this moment of crisis to be able to look to my leaders for that. And I think we're all aspiring to be that kind of leader for each other. So part of that being leader for each other, I'll give a couple of examples, but then I know uh, Chase may have some more specific questions. Kareen has already mentioned the dance party, which has been our infant and early childhood folks have said, we want to offer some services to families with young kids. That stay at home order is going to be really hard. I got to host one of these um, a couple of weeks ago, and what was really cool for me is seeing that, I mean, this is little kids, so it's, it's really more jumping around than dancing, but they're in the routine of doing this, and there were parents in the background on their computers, you could see getting some work done while their kids were getting their wiggles out. Now, think about that service to the community, like right there, that creativity that is giving those families that respite for 30 minutes a day in a really fun way. Um, there, there are many, many other examples, but I think that kind of seizing the moment, seizing the opportunity, so it's the care, but it's also the creativity. I know one of the things that came up actually in one of these C plus V um, talks was just talking about diversity issues and in particular um, different marginalized groups that really might be struggling in, in particular ways. But I know in my group, um, there's a group of Asian students that are starting regular meetings just to talk about the microaggressions that they've experienced and to look for creative ways, not only to support each other, but to raise consciousness and raise awareness. And so the, that willingness to say, okay, we can set up a Zoom meeting, we can do an invitation, we can really serve our community. Um, I have other examples, but I'll let other people talk. It's been really powerful to see that. Thank you all so much for sharing those examples. Yeah, as uh, I came on my first day was the only day I was in the office and I've been virtual ever since. And I can just say um, every single community member has asked me how I'm doing, 
has checked in, has encouraged self-care. Um, people have just said, make sure you're taking care of yourself and they've been completely understanding. And um, I think that this has just given us a unique opportunity. One of the things out of this is just to kind of be in the here and now with each other as a community. So thank you all so much for those examples. And um, as we're navigating this process as a community, as we've settled in and, and kind of started to think about um, what does life look like in this virtual world after it's not um, quite as acute um, getting the virtual community set up is we've been hearing more and more from members of the community about um, trying to find moments to laugh or find humor or some way to ground yourself. I love the dance party example. And so sometimes humor is what gets us through in those moments um, where we can just come together in that human experience as Shelly put it and Rohini put it. Um, I love that in those webinars. So can you share something that has made you smile or, or laugh or been a moment of maybe joy or coming together um, during this time? So I think uh, some of the best times are um, in those meetings that you have that they're now daily and used to be like monthly, uh, where people try to just bring a little lightness to the conversation. I can reflect on the number of a Dean's conversations where um, somebody had put up a backdrop that would engage people in a little light humor or a name, change their name on the screen to something that you might not see, but halfway through the conversation, you realize something wasn't right. Or the fact that uh, unannounced, right? A cat, a kid, a husband shows up on screen and somebody is scrambling to turn off their mic. Um, that sense of humanity, that sense of, um, oh, they're actually experiencing exactly what I'm experiencing right now has been, uh, a really warm spot, but has definitely um, made me laugh a lot. I also am just so grateful to the faculty and the staff, uh, even the students that have been sending us um, little notes that contain humor in them about their own humorous thing that has occurred or a quote they heard or a, a, um, something that they saw. Um, there was a time this week that I was reading one out loud to a few people here in Mary Reed, and I was laughing so hard that I could not actually tell them what I was reading. And they finally just took it out of my hand, right? Like, give me that because you're useless. <laughs> Those moments are going to live forever, right? And they're just, they, they happen enough to just keep us all going. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of the, the specifics because most of them are like people sending around goofy videos of, you know, like something that doesn't sound funny in this context, somebody falling in water or something, but at the right moment, like, oh, you knew I would think that was funny. It's absolutely perfect. My favorite really is, though, what you're saying, like the faculty member who has a new puppy and like that, that that's how you partly get through the day is every meeting you get to meet, talk to the puppy for a few minutes. That that people are willing to do that and to kind of humor each other with that has been really helpful. Yeah, I was also thinking about sort of, I think part of, you know, finding humor during a time of crisis is really important because this work is very serious. We're charged with protecting each other and protecting this entire community. So we take that very seriously, but if we cannot sort of laugh and find levity along the way, it gets far too heavy. Um, you know, and I think part of, if you've seen some of the videos of as the new normal, people are getting used to the Zoom technology, you probably saw the video of the lady who forgot the, she was Zooming and she went to the restroom and she forgot to turn it off. And why we laugh at that is because we can all see, we're like, oh my goodness, have I almost nearly done that? So, you know, I think it's in those moments that we're not necessarily laughing at, we're laughing with because that's the humanity and the connection for all of us because for, this is new technology for most of us and certainly using it in this way is new. So we that's what the joy comes from is that we can say, hey, I, you know, I've nearly done that kind of thing as well. I think the other great thing is, is sometimes when it's been really bad, Michael and I have been on the phone and it's been humorous for me for somebody to say, can I curse at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought of that. I think I'm talking to the provost right now, but I've, I've got a select word that I'd like to use. Do I have permission? <laughs> yeah, you have to check whether the webinar is being recorded or not, right? 
<laughs> but the, the, the act of asking permission <laughs> is just really just these moments of humor. And, and we've all done it, right? We've all looked at uh, somebody on a Zoom and said, can I be completely candid? <laughs> And, and you laugh about it because you're just taking a moment to enjoy each other and enjoy the situation in a different perspective. Yeah, that's what I... Uh, the same thing. Yeah, yeah someone shared uh, an article about how this has been such a powerful time just because it's given us a chance to kind of blur the lines between personal and professional and realize that we're all human and we have dogs and kids and partners and, and people at home and we're all trying to just make this work. And so um, those moments of writing an email and you're like, I want to be myself, but I want to share in this experience. And uh, someone was saying every single email has to start with, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're staying healthy. But also there's those moments of, um, you know, we can laugh and, and bond through this process together. And so as we think about those things, what do you think people need during the situation and, and how is DU working to be there for people and their needs during this whole thing? We've talked about humor and we've talked about building community, but what else do people need? And um, can you dive in a little bit more on that? So on the first day of class, we received a, I received a letter from a student and I think this drove it home in a way I'd never thought about it before. The student just wrote uh, to the faculty member with gratitude. I have gratitude that the class happened when it was scheduled to happen and it went the whole time. And we learned the content of the class. And it was the one thing in this day that I did normal. It's the one thing every day that I get to do that's normal, even if it's online. And I began to think that what the, the greatest gift the university is giving to its faculty, its staff, even to society, is an anchor of normalcy in a time when there's very little normalcy, right? And we underappreciate the contribution we're making in that place. That piece will help with anxiety, that piece helps with isolation, that piece helps with hope. Um, to me, that's the, the far most overlooked thing that we do day in, day out, that almost the rest of society doesn't have an opportunity to do and we should revel in that we should take great pride in that michael or shelly yeah i thought i saw michael jo michael's yellow i didn't want to step on your toes um yeah i well i i think it's a great question and for me it's also a work in progress right now you know when you say what else could we be doing or what do we need I think being open to what we might need and listening to each other is really huge. But what came to mind immediately with your question is one of the things that we've really worked on is um, kind of developing a new student resource task force, just trying to be really intentional and have really good communication so that students know that they can um, turn to the university. And a, a little bit, I, I love what Corrine said about us being an anchor and that idea that we really have the capacity to continue to give the students the chance to get their education. I think there are all kinds of resources that we actually do have and students, maybe like all of us, trying to be professional and trying really hard not to need things. And the beauty of this time is we all need things right now. And so we can quit pretending just like we can, we don't have to pretend that we don't have pets or family members or stresses at home, uh, but we're, Frankly, in, in my department, we're struggling with this a bit right now. And one of the conversations we had is for faculty to remind students repeatedly that it's okay to need something and to be tuned into that. We have advertised like the student emergency fund, for example, and a student went to a faculty member and said, well, I don't think that this is really a total emergency that I'm facing. I probably do actually have enough food and that the drama of, no, 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 you, you don't have to apologize about that. If you're worried that you might not have enough food, this is a question that it's okay to have with your faculty member. And this was after three different times of kind of going back to saying, there's this resource, there's this resource, don't forget. So I think staying engaged with that process of um, looking at what each other needs and how the university can, can uh, be a resource for how we can all be a resource within the university is important. Yeah, I was also 
thinking along those same lines. I think when, when the crisis began, folks were asking, hey, Michael, you're a psychologist. Can you tell me why people are running out and buying toilet paper? Is there some GI component to this illness that I don't know anything about? Or what is it? And I said, you know, I think people are trying to seek control where they can have it. And where, you know, Shelley talked about the routine and, and, and Kareen's example also gave that. People are looking for normalcy. How can I find normalcy when I've never been through this before? And I think one of the great things that will come out of this, you know, we're, we're residential, um, university and I think um, reminding folks that there, as a as an instructor myself, I think one of the things I've been thinking about is how can I be a better teacher by using these technologies. Do I think that face-to-face -face education is superior? Absolutely. But you can bet that I'm going to be using technology at the end of this in a way that I wasn't before. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is, you know, folks are like, well, how long will you be teaching remotely as an institution? Have you made those decisions? No, we haven't. But I will tell you that I suspect of the faculty, we are finding new ways to engage people that we hadn't before. So I think to not just, you know, be unrealistic about the limitations, but to think about how are we getting stronger through this? Because we are all strengthening muscles that maybe most of us probably didn't have before. So I look forward to the days that we're welcoming students back on our campus and engaging with them inside the classroom and outside the classroom. But I bet we're gonna be better at that as a result having gone through that experience and, and, and being explicit about that and talking to people about it because that's what we're looking for because we don't know, is it a year? How long before we return to what we were familiar with before? I think we're gonna come out of this stronger. Yeah, I also think that when I think about this question, Shelley made me think about what are the things that we're doing right now and that we're trying to expand on and do that are concrete for people to know about. Like when this all started, one of the first things we did was make sure everybody's paycheck was whole. That was in a two week period when so many other countries, companies were just laying people off. And then we were able to prolong that for another month after that. That stands in dramatic contrast for me about how DU has tried to behave compared to other places. But we've also done things like refund money to students for housing and fees, parking, where other institutions haven't done that. And it boggles my mind why you wouldn't do this, but, but it's the right thing to do, it's hard. But all along the way, we've been transparent about how hard that is financially, but been also um, asking people to lean in and, and do things on their expenditures to make sure it's happened. But we've also set up emergency funds. I don't know if people know about all of that, right? Uh, we, we have an, um, a student emergency fund run out of CLE uh, that when we started this had very little money in and we put out a call to alumni and it's well over $100,000 now, right? We're in, we've seen giving from all places and we've been able to do things at a community in, at, at, in our community that seems so much more responsive to the, um, the, the home and the food insecurities that you hear about coming out of other sectors um, and even other just different higher education institutions. When I think about how we're responding and what we're trying to do, it really is like concrete stuff to, to make those, those little things when they add up, you add 10 of them up, it's transfer, transformational, right? And, and that's very exciting to watch do you do. And, and the commitment, as we've said, is little things in every division or in every place, every unit, trying to think about how they keep building this as they go forward. It's, it's, it's very neat to watch this transform and not just be in one central location on campus. Yeah, that's such a great example, Karine. And I'm wondering, Shelley, do you have any specific examples that come to mind like that of just community members showing up in, in ways or coming together as a community in this time? You know, I'm, I'm going to answer your question a little bit differently in terms of what I've seen faculty members do that sounds so small, but then I hear from students about what they're grateful for. And it goes a little bit with what Michael was saying about being really trying to be creative and to be sure that the teaching and just that the experience is really robust and how what we do gets to, to allow people to be, feel cared for. So, for example, in um, 
one of the sports psychology classes, they were talking about changing the backdrop every day to some different kind of sporting arena to make it really fun or an Olympic event or something just like, no, this, you know, we, we miss seeing you face to face and here's how we're going to make up for it. And so the faculty members care for the students in that way it was fantastic. Another faculty member um, sends a preview email before the students get on Canvas because the students are complaining about navigating everything on Canvas and how hard it is and like to have this kind of fun map for the day with a joke before they start having class. And so I think to me sometimes really remembering and valuing those little touches feels really, really powerful. But the community thing, and, and Michael has been hugely involved in this, we have turned all of our um, clinic, clinical operations to online in like a two week period. It has been an absolute monumental heavy lift and it has been all the supervisors and the students and the administrators getting all of this out has been absolutely incredible and it means that the members of our community who use our clinical services were able to continue their clinical care through this crisis. So that's been really powerful too. And that lift was the clinic's IT uh, guidance and policies and I mean uh, you just can't imagine what sounds like maybe just a, a pretty hard job for a couple people. It probably took a hundred people and it was super cool to watch it. It was, that's a great example, Shelley. Michael, do you have any examples that come to mind for you? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about early in the crisis um, as we, the community, the medical community was looking at, you know, we're, we're short on masks. We were starting to see videos um, out of other major metropolitan areas where doctors and nurses were wearing trash bags and and our medical staff said, okay, Michael, you know, Denver Health needs some of our protective, uh, personal protective uh, wear. How can we get that? How can we do that? So they were the first to gather the materials out of our medical clinics and transfer it to the ER um, over at um, Denver Health. And it was so touching. And then they didn't end there. We were sort of thinking about, okay, how can we reduce if we have folks who need to be tested, how can we do that in a safe place? And they were the first to say, we are going to do this. This is our job. We are here to care for our community in that way. They continue to do that. They have signed up to serve um, our local hospitals for free on their own personal time, on the weekends, in the evenings, to help relieve their, our overtaxed um, medical system, when people are working around the clock in our local hospitals to, to take care of people, our DU employees, our medical staff, raised their hands from the beginning and said, we are here for you community, we are here for you DU, and we're here for you Denver. And I've just been so touched at, and, and people don't pause about that. They realize that they're putting their lives on the line, but we, as DU stepped up, we moved that over, and then our people said, I'm going to do this work on the weekend, and I'm going to help um, relieve these these people who need help. And that's just been so touching to see. Yeah, yeah I want to add on to that a little bit because when I had talked about our clinical operation moving to telepsychology services and, and what a heavy lift that was, as we were learning to do that, our alumni person and some of our faculty realized, oh, we could offer some of these workshops for our alums too because they, if they're in practice, they're going to have these exact same needs. And we had over, we so far have had over 400 people that we've trained in these um, for free, people just volunteering their time to do the training. And the super big bonus is people have said, I've wanted to do more of this with DU. This time I don't have to worry about parking. It's been great. <laughs> yeah. That's one huge positive that comes out of it, right? <laughs> um, and with these moments of uh, the community coming together, I was wondering if anybody would be willing to share, and, and Michael, maybe we could start with you, is something that has been personally hard for you and how you've navigated that through this process. Yeah, um, I think the gravity of the financial impact on our country, our state, our institution, is something that I think a lot about. How can, um, you know, the institution, as Karine has said, has stood behind its employees, behind everybody who's here. 
And so I think about the serious financial impact and how can I be a leader in advocating for folks and be creative about how we're using our money. So I think it's been personally difficult because we've needed to be here to, to take the leadership in, in responding to this crisis. But there are people on the front line who, um, you know, the, their paychecks are living paycheck to paycheck. So how, what am I doing? Um, and so that's what keeps me up at night. How am I advocating for my folks? How am I thinking about new ways to bring grants into or to other to supplement? Because it's my job to be looking after these kinds of things. So there are certain things that I can control and there are things that I can't. So it's been, that's really one of, that's the first thing that um, came to my mind about how am I caring for the people that are relying on me to be advocating and showing up for them in spaces that matter. Thank yeah, you. My, my story would be similar that I um, was when, you know, our, our students also do field work in the community and we, we early on were trying to be really deliberate about saying your safety is paramount. You know, we want you to get good training, but you've got to be safe. And then probing with a particular student, having him say, well, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be going to do this face-to-face -face psychological assessment, but I get paid for that and I need the money. And want, you know, wanting immediately to find ways to, to just be sure, how, how do we show up for you where we don't put you in a position of being in danger? And so I'm sure that for that one story that I heard and got to work directly with that student, there are plenty more that I haven't heard yet that I want to be sure that we're attending to. I think the hardest thing for me has been uh, accepting ambiguity, right? Yeah, this is a position in which you're supposed to have all the answers and you can't. Um, it's impossible at the rate of change of the information, at the, uh, the number of distractions and competing priorities that come in the door. Um, and through that, the one thing you had to learn was um, how do you focus every decision, every answer to give people confidence by using your own personal and professional principles and values so that people on your team know your answer before you give it, even when they know you don't have an answer. Um, how do you uh, give people that sense of it's going to be just fine, uh, that um, you, I don't have any answers for you at the moment, but I still, it's going to be just fine, right? I think that is one of the hardest things that we've had to deal with um, in leadership, what is just that um, comfort level, uh, that authentic, still being totally authentic and not lying, but living in a very um, a time of massive ambiguity, right? And, and that can be destabilizing if you can't adjust to it and really embrace it. So that I, I think if you look at the, all the weeks I've been at that, every one of them has that, that element to it, right? Every piece, every time, every, every positive case that Michael and Far, Far and I had to deal with, we never had all the information yet we had to make some pretty big decisions Every time we've made a policy change, every time we've done something financial that could have been millions of dollars, uh, yet you didn't have complete data in order to do that decision correctly, yet timing made it that you needed to make that decision that night or in that day. It, it's living in ambiguity. It's a very interesting mode for a leadership um, time when people think that leadership should be fully data informed and that you should have mostly all the answers to then be thrown into a crisis in which you realize uh, that's great, but you got to trust your principal values and your instincts um, more than anything and, and uh, make sure that everybody around you know them and share in them so that they can answer the questions too if you're not around. So that it's, it's been, that's the biggest struggle, I think. And Kareen, you mentioned your, your principles and values, and I'm curious, what values are helping guide you during this time of ambiguity? Uh, I've relied on sort of a few. One is um, uh, make sure the students are supported and get the best educational value they can get, right? Whatever that experience is, is make sure they're getting the best we can provide. Um, second is really about the people. Put your current employee workforce first and foremost in your mind. 
that safety, security, pay, whatever you want, but put them first in your mind. And then the last thing I think that I've led with and, and that people really close to me have seen is do the right thing regardless of what that does to you, right? Always do the right thing. Thanks, Kareem. Michael or Shelley, have you leaned on any values or anything like that as you're guiding through this work? And it's so, so many unknowns. You, you know, um, one of the things that I, I was reflecting on as Kareem was talking is that um, what we know about this virus really is changing, changes so quickly. And what we've learned very early on was that, you know, Kareem talked about that, you know, the, the decisions we needed to do our due diligence, we needed to consult with the CDC, we needed to stick uh, consult with international experts and do our reading. And that meant that we were in, in particularly in the first few weeks, figuring out we were up for hours reading and consuming everything that we could because we needed to make the right decisions. But what Kareen, in under Kareen's leadership, what she, what she did was she empowered people. She empowered people, whether you're in facilities and operations, you're a faculty member, you're a department head, no matter where you are, she empowered people to stand up and take leadership. And that's what we did at DU. And that's a value that has permeated through no matter what your role is, it's been so inspiring is give people the opportunity to take the leadership, do it in, an, in the best educated way that you can and do it together, rely on each other, consult, consult, consult. But I think that that's why we have been um, thankfully ahead of this throughout this entire crisis that just the sands keep shifting, but people keep stepping up and taking leadership. Yeah, I, I love that. And I would, I would totally reinforce that kind of extreme ownership mentality that's been, that Kareem, you know, that's been really throughout the whole administration has been great. I, I want to add something slightly different though. I, I just recognize how much I value human connection and this idea of having, you know, we say it's so it's physical distancing, not social distancing. It's not the same if you're not really physically close to people. And so I, I try to have as much of that connection as I can and provide that support. And it's, it feels really hard not to be able to see people and be with them. I think the other thing that um, Michael and I have seen that I think most people haven't is the bad behavior that can come out in yeah. a time like this. Um, early on, Michael and I unfortunately got to see people using a COVID as a cover and uh, creating anxiety and anxious and chaos, and then it turning out to be a f false. And um, to see that other human side, although small, less than 1% of the time, it was agonizing for Michael and I to watch it occur and what it did to the community as it unfolded and then how people couldn't believe it was true when we had to tell them it was false. Um, that has been, um, it's, there, there is still bad behavior and to watch it at a time like this has been difficult. I don't know if you want to share something about that, Mike, Michael. That was hard for us. Yeah, I think I think both of us believe in the best in people and and the vast majority of people step up in those ways. And it's hard, I don't know, I, I think with each of those cases, I, I guess it feels personal sometimes. It feels like there's a system that's trying to respond and care for one another. And, and you can feel, it can almost hurt your feelings, I think. You think we need to be showing up. And that's what 99 per point whatever percent of the folks are. But um, yeah, I think there, are, there were those opportunities when it was disheartening. Uh, disheartening. And, um, and we did, you know, we tried to just rely on each other and support each other through even those difficult, uh, difficult times. Yeah, and that's a, a perfect segue into, I've, I've seen some questions popping up and I want to um, honor, honor folks questions of, as a community during these times, like there's kind of the different parts that come out and people have been asking, you know, how do I cope with this or how do I deal with this part? Or there are issues still underlying around diversity, equity, and inclusion amidst all of these things. And so um, I've seen some, some really powerful questions come up and I'll hand it over to Anne um, because I think that's a good segue into that 
as things kind of settle in and, and you think about this as a community and the values that are driving our work, um, we just are so grateful for the DU community and grateful to, to you three and everybody that you've talked about um, as we guide Community Plus Values because it's given us an opportunity to kind of dig in on the good, the bad, and the ugly and all the things that come in between. And so um, we're just uh, thankful for everybody coming together as a community and I'll hand it over to Anne for Q&A. But thank you all for being so authentic and vulnerable and sharing those moments and, and giving people shout outs where shout outs are due. We so appreciate it. And with that, Anne, I will hand it back to you for Q&A. We've had some great questions come in. So thank you to those in the audience that have handed those on. Yeah, and, and, um, and keep them coming. Thanks, Chase. Uh, I think that's great. I love having um, just voices from the community and new voices in your case. I think that's great. Um, so let's talk about this, this idea of how do we take care of ourselves. So you've um, shared some of the moments of stress. There are two, two ways of looking at this, I think, that we've seen come in in the question. One is, what's something that you might do that would be kind of an underlying or, or daily practice that you might have or you might suggest? And then how do you ground yourself in the moments in between, right? Those kind of, um, I, I get to sit next to Shelly in meetings. I know taking deep breaths is something that I, I just, it's like contagious. I love being next to you. So, but what are some of the things that we can do that are, that are small little nuggets and then what, what's kind of something we could do in a more ongoing way? Um, Kareen, do you wanna jump in? Sure. Um, uh, so there was a time early on where I really felt like uh, focus was, um, being lost because things were coming in so fast. So some of the things that I deployed and people helped me with was really each day start off with what absolutely needs to get done today and make that, we call it a punch list around here. And we do it every person on our team. And at the end of the day, we wrap up with what wins did we have? It doesn't matter how small. If we couldn't actually feel like we moved through the punch list and we had those wins, I think it would be unbearable to stay on topic and force, uh, focus. I think actually um, we, I've learned to lean a lot a lot on people for support, way more than I ever have in the past in my life. Um, those could be simple like uh, grabbing my good friend's dogs and uh, going for a walk with them, with my kids. They're not my dogs. <laughs> I don't want dogs. <laughs> no one give me dogs. Uh, but to watch the, the simple act of an hour walk and how it um, really regrows the kids and therefore probably regrow, regrew me at the same time was really important. Um, I also think that uh, taking care of just the daily things, right? Eat right, eat at regular times. Um, uh, the de deans know I'm not so good at this, but forcing myself to sleep a real number of hours every night. Uh, these are things that have really, I think, kept um, me in a place where I could continue to function and function at a high level, but also to feel like I'm making it through really well, right? I'm doing a really good job of my own emotional state and my own mental state as a result. And those are just small, succinct things that I don't think are grandiose um, or things that you have to learn that you didn't know how to do before, right? That they're just remembering what you probably did in the past and deploying them in a more methodical way by assigning them particular hours in the day that you'll do them. Right. That's great. Shelly, what about you? Well, I Kareen's hit on a lot of really key ideas. I think that idea that having a routine and knowing that your routine includes the exercise, nutrition, sleep, all those basics that can get lost if you don't, if you've got a new routine, if you have to create the routine yourself instead of having work impose it, I think that's really important. I think um, also part of that routine is being sure that there's time when you're not gonna work because this blurring of the boundary of work and home, you know, when it's there all the time, it can be really easy to, um, not take enough time for yourself, not have some of those other bright spots. I've already alluded to a lot of, I realize that a lot of the bright spots in my life are hanging out with other people. And I can do that with, you know, the Zoom happy hours, what, what people do. It, it's still hard though. I've had to read novels, find TV shows, you know, do some things that normally just to kind of put that little serotonin dopamine burst in my day. And I need to be sure that it's there every day um, to keep me going. We had one person who asked specifically, I mean, you mentioned routines, so I think about this question, um, who said, 
I, I feel like all those days are blending together. Is there a way to not, you know, to kind of <laughs> to make that up? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any suggestions or thoughts on that specifically? Like how to kind of break up your week or your month? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that you have to be very intentional about it. And one, one of the things that gets said a lot in these kinds of um, ad advice webinars is this is a chance to really know yourself. And so knowing yourself to know what is going to allow you to break those things up is really important. Um, to have a different weekend than week routine and to challenge yourself. What should that look like? Will it be a different kind of exercise that you do? Um, I, I know I try to do a, a bigger like hike outdoor, whatever it is on Saturday. Um, I still get to do my church online on Sunday and kind of try to keep up that same as, as much as I can re replicate what was in my routine for the, uh, before this happened is helpful. Michael, what about you? How are you, how are you taking care of yourself and maybe some tips and tricks that you would share? Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, what became really important for me early on. So my, my partner's an engineer and I'm a clinical psychologist by training. So, and one who uh, has a background in public health. And so my life from the beginning has been, you know, as we alluded to before, consuming as much information as I can about COVID. Well, my right. partner programs all day and spends the time not ta thinking about COVID. And so the last thing I wanted to talk about when I got home was COVID. The very first <laughs> thing he wanted to talk about was how is the family doing? What, what's happening in COVID and how is COVID impacting people? So what, what I, and I, what I needed to do was to figure out, okay, how much I know um, on, on the previous seminar, one thing that Shelley recommended for folks is sort of monitoring how much news that you're taking in and that sort of thing. So what I needed, what I figured out about myself is it was my job as uh, a, a chief public health officer for the University of Denver to consume as much as I could about this, but what were the boundaries going to be in my personal life? You know, when, we, when I joined these Zoom game nights or happy hours or whatever they are, of course, that's what people want to talk about. Um, and sometimes they're looking for my expertise in that way. But I needed to titrate that because if I was doing that for, for 8, 10, 12 hours of my workday and then doing that at home, it was really, really exhausting. And I found myself getting irritable and like, oh, my God, no, we don't think this is coming from bats. Like, yes, yeah, stop, you know, this kind of thing. So I think it was really important to figure out when, how was I going to get away from that, recognize that. As an asthmatic, my partner is very anxious about the health ramifications for how can I be there and present, but also recognize that doesn't mean that I need to be 24 seven. So what did that mean for me? That was sort of a self analysis so that I could be helpful giving people accurate information of what we know about this, but not be at the cost that I didn't have any of anything else other than COVID-19 in my life. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's so true. I, um, I think decision fatigue has been a big deal for me. So, so I'm like, I don't want to make any decisions in my family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want jello for dinner? Great. I, I'm not making any decisions like, beyond sitting here at these decisions. Um, what about uh, how do we, um, we have a faculty member, sister friend, who has asked, um, how do I make sure that I'm teaching my students about self-reliance and self-care? This came up for me actually also with our CWC scholars and saying, there's a, there's a, there's a line right now between saying, we really want this to be a teaching moment, a learning moment, and then also a line of saying, there are some situations that are dire enough where you really have to sort of intervene as a, um, a specific, you know, as a leader or something like that. So um, one, how do you teach when you need to? And then how do you know when you need to actually just kind of step in? Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Shelley? Yeah. It in, in a way, it, it gets back to me for what, what's hard doing this remotely, because I think so much of that is just intuitive when you're spending time with people that you know that. And so to, to, you have to be more intentional, ask the questions. And there's, you know, I, I hear this question really along the spectrum. You know, when do you need to really step in and kind of, I'm thinking the student that I talked about when I said, wait a minute, let's talk about you going to this field placement. I don't think it's a good idea. Why do you think it's a good idea? Let's have that conversation. And I was a little bit more uh, forceful 
But then there's also the other side of the coin saying how, not just how can do you take care of you and how can we provide resources, but to really challenge the students to say, how are you taking care of yourself? And what are you learning about your own resilience? And how are you taking responsibility for yourself right now in a variety of ways? And to me, that's part of the beauty of working at a university is that's part of our job is that kind of transformational experience that we want students to have. So this crisis really almost puts that in, in high gear, you know, that you're supposed to be learning about yourself right now and taking good care of yourself as part of this process. Yeah. Um, Michael, there's a very specific question. Are you doing Zoom game nights? Okay, well, I'm not getting paid by this uh, company, but I will tell you, um, <laughs> a, a really fun, neat one is push push the button. It's called. It's through. You can get it as a. You, I think you pay twenty bucks, and then ten of you can play, and there's no limitation. But you each are assigned either a person or an alien, and you're assigned comparable tasks and your job is so you get log on independently i get really excited about this i'm thank you maggie for this question <laughs> uh, so each person at home logs on and you find out if you're an alien or a person and then you're doing it collectively and so the zoom part is you're sort of laughing and playing with each other and you can figure out by the end uh you've got it's a time limited piece who are the aliens who are the humans and if you get it right then you save the you save humanity and if you get it wrong you're thrown back into uh the outer space so there are lots of creative things like that that you can do virtually um i'm in having fun with push the button That's that sounds thing. fun Maybe you might have to mine that um that piece of you to do some fun things for c plus c i think one of the things we've been hearing from the community is we just we need a little fun and a little levity and a place to kind of um, be a pressure valve and can C plus C do that for us occasionally. So, so. And you um, know what, and the rule for our game nights is that we can't, we don't mention COVID. So that's something we set out. We can talk about COVID at other times, <laughs> but we can show up with a beverage of your choice, whatever that is, and no, we don't mention COVID at all for that hour, two hours. That's, that's the rule. I love that. And that makes sense. What you were saying about how you need to delineate and titrate. Absolutely. <laughs> I think maybe you made that rule. Um, it's possible. All right. We have time for just one last question. Um, Karine, I'm going to direct this one to you. Um, this is, what are your trusted sources for information right now? Um, you know, you're doing a lot of analysis. Um, you have an analytical background, <laughs> um, right? And where do you send people? I have to say, you are, I think, a very trusted resource for, for us within the Dean's Council. Um, but what, what, where are you getting all of, all of your good information? Oh, that's... Um, so early on, when this started, I used the Department of State and the CDC, and then something happened that uh, lost my trust. Um, they didn't update their data. They weren't making decisions consistent with past behavior. And I had to move to uh, non-governmental sources. And I hate to say this because I am a person that believes wholeheartedly in uh, government agencies. Um, I had to move to gathering data from a number of different places. So uh, I gather data now from government sources. I gather data from uh, think tanks at different universities because of course these are my people and I love them. I gather uh, data from nonprofit watchdog organizations and look at their data. I also look at uh, crowdsource data, so Wikipedia. Um, in my leadership team, they call my predictive abilities the crystal ball because I've almost nailed every date at this point. Um, and it's partly because I spend a lot of time on Sunday evenings um, doing what engineers do, which is gather all the data create their own models, because uh, I don't trust anybody's models. That's the beauty of a scientist. Um, and begin to path things out in my head. And in that, uh, I think I get, I get more confidence in what comes out of certain agencies now. And I have a way to believe or, or understand its assumptions or limitations. Um, uh, and that seems like way too much work for the average person is, is what I'm I just want to end with, I think that's way too much work for the average person. Um, but I think there are really smart people out there doing the exact same thing I'm doing. And uh, you find those people in the community and they're not just speaking from their hip. They have data to back it up and they're willing to share it. And they're yeah. willing uh, for you to have a different opinion based on the same data. Those are the things that really give me the greatest confidence. And so, uh, <clears throat> 
universities and the thought leadership of faculty and the scholarship has become my source. Um, there was a point where I was losing faith in some countries reporting and faculty universities stood up publicly and went against what was being said and provided their own data sets. And it just reassured me in the power of research and scholarship on a university campus and how it is the essential public good. Um, and essentially that's where I live now, right? I, I just gone back to my pure passion and love as the source point for me. And I'm looking at a lot of great universities. John Hopkins has an incredible website that you can work through in which they parse out the stupidity and put in the reality. Um, they don't do a lot of commentary except for webinars that they put out. Um, it's, it's solid, it's really solid. And so there's a few other universities like that that I think are doing a great job. Um, uh, and I think there's people in every community who are smart people like that, that are doing their own analysis. And I find those people very reassuring to talk with and to engage with. Um, yeah. So it's when not I wanna... the answer, but it's the truth. Well, and I think it's a it's an answer that is specific to a DU community with, you know, not looking for sole sources, doing some of our own homework. Um, that kind of just ingenuity and um, and uh, and an, and analytical skills and intellectual ability. I mean, that's what we're about. So um, I think it's a perfect answer, actually, given the context that you're in and the role you have. Um, I want to say thank you so much, Michael, Kareen, Shelley. You um, uh, uh, are just daily um, inspirations, I think, to all of us. And so taking the time out of what I know is an incredibly um, difficult schedule for all of you is um, is really meaningful. So um, on a personal note, thank you. And, and thank you on behalf of our C plus D community. I want to point out to everybody that um, you can access old chat windows if you want to. If you look um, on Zoom, there are ways to do that. And, uh, and there are a couple of good resources that people have put out here. Um, an online babysitting or virtual babysitting resource that um, Valentina um, Iturbe Lagrave put out. And then also um, some information on some of the student resources that are available. So, and then here on screen, you see the C plus V, um, our, our email and some other university web, uh, university resources that are available on the web. So access those, use those, share your stories with us. Um, we are now on Instagram and on Facebook and we would love to just kind of keep talking about what a great place this community is um, and how we all work together to make it even better every day. So thank you so much. Have a great Thursday. Um, keep up the good work, everybody. Bye. Taking care of each other.